Um, I adapted some of my workshop, pre-conference workshop, and so we're going to go some through some of this, and it's going to be a little bit like a fire hydrant. Um, and um, I just have to say, I really enjoyed the first two speakers, too, this morning. And Jonathan, you know, he should do a comedy tour, don't you think? I mean, that's like, why you limit yourself to medicine? <laughs> um, okay, so... We want to increase our knowledge of thoracolumbar fascial anatomy uh, and be able to see the, this fascia as a source of low back pain and also as an integrator of upper and lower extremities. So um, I can't tell you how many times now that I, when I look at the, the now that I've looked at the low back fascia so much that um, I often go, hmm, you came in with hip pain. Do you have any shoulder pain? Oh, well, yeah. <laughs> and then hold in a certain area of the fascia and test their arm and you know it's strong and they're like hey i don't feel the shoulder pain so it's just it's helpful to to be aware that this is such an integrator uh this region of body movement um and then uh we'll identify some of these fascial structures on ultrasound uh, okay so it's important to have this basic distinction in your head when you're thinking fascia the superficial fascia is the panicular fascia or the fascia layer that's in the fat right so skin superficial fascia and then the deep fascia is basically where you start muscle so the deeper and besting fascia is everything below the fat um, the subcutaneous fat um, and it's helpful just to keep that in mind so if you put an ultrasound probe for instance on this region on this patient that i showed the other day is my little thing yeah um, then you can kind of go, okay, skin, fat, superficial fascia, another layer of fat, but not as much of the lobules below that. And from that picture we just looked at, there's connective tissue going from the skin to the superficial fascia, connective tissue going from the superficial fascia to the deep fascia, which is part of why kinesio tape works so well to help cue muscles, right? You're tensioning the skin, thus you're tensioning the superficial fascia, thus you're tensioning the deep fascia and helping cue the muscle. It's not a strength factor of the tape. The tape isn't a strength thing. It's a, just a cueing. It's a help priming the tension a little bit in the muscle, from my viewpoint. Um, and again, just a reminder of what we talked about yesterday, that the embryonic fascia predates the embryonic bone and muscle and other mesenchymal tissues. So the fascia is the context for all these other tissues. So the more we understand this interconnectivity of fascia, the more we'll understand you know, movement, um, and uh, quickly, uh, if we think about this deep investing fascia, you can kind of make three separations in your head. One being the hypaxial fascia, which is the trunk fascia anterior to the transverse process, and the epaxial fascia, which is posterior to the transverse um, process of the spine. And then attaching to that is the appendicular fascia that starts as your limb buds and migrates to that midline. So then you've got, you know, abdomen, uh, paraspinals, and then extremities all integrating together um, in that structure. So when you then look at your back, uh, you've got two upper extremity muscles in your back, trapezius and latissimus dorsi. Both of those feed into the posterior layer of the thoracolumbar fascia that's closest to the skin. Um, and this is one of those brilliant um, anatomy pictures from Vleeming that shows how integrated these structures are. So when you look at that first layer, you peel off the fat and the superficial fascia and peel that off. And if you see the first layer of the deep fascia, you're looking at two arm muscles and one leg muscle, which is your glute max. So this is a probe looking um, in the axial plane at your glute max. This is the femur actually. So when you put the probe down, you look at that muscle, you know, this is connecting to the posterior layer in the low back. And it's also connecting to the contralateral latissimus dorsi through those cross-linked fibers. And so you start to being able to picture when you put a probe on, you're like, there's that white line or that group of white there. And you can picture in your mind away from where that is of what it's connecting to once you learn this anatomy. Uh, and then you start starting to put things together like this. You know, the same patient I showed yesterday, he is standing on his right leg and he has no problem. He stands on his left leg and suddenly what happens? Well, he's throwing his arms out, right? Why is he throwing his arms out? 
He's recruiting his lower traps so that he can tension his thoracolumbar fascia and feel where his back is in space because he's got tears, which if you look at last year's lecture, or come to one of my workshops, we go over this in detail. He's got tears here. He's got tears here in his fascia. He's been, his fascia has been cut through here three different times from surgeries. Uh, and he can't, he doesn't know where these muscles are in space. He can't find them. And so he's trying to tension them with his arms so that he can then start to register those muscles and get them, get them working. Besides his glute med, which was a mess, but you'll have to hear that story another time. Uh, but he started out on all these medicines and all this chronic pain, and he, these are his three surgeries. You know, he had his L4 done, then he had his L5-S1 done, and then years later he had um, the L4 to S1 with the pedicle screws, and then he was on disability. Um, and when he came to me, he had all this ridiculous pain, sciatica, what's this coming from? Um, people are wanting to go back in and block his nerves and his spine, and it was all myofascial stuff. And speaking to what Jonathan said, I couldn't have said that at the beginning. I often tell patients, I'll be confident of your diagnosis once you're fixed, which is not the way medical school, you know, we're not supposed to treat people till we have a diagnosis, right? So uh, to treat these chronic pain things, you have to be comfortable with a lot of ambiguity and be able to continue to function and just keep getting feedback and adjusting your diagnosis as you go. And most, you know, in the medical model, we're not supposed to do that. We're supposed to know and then proceed and there's a lot of not knowing in this field. Um, so hopefully you're here because you're comfortable with some of that. Um, but we, anyway, we've, he's, he's completely off all of his hydromorphone and is fine now after multiple treatments. Um, and this was the first places I injected on him. Um, and what we've injected here is basically fascial attachments to these ribs, which includes latissimus dorsi, serratus posterior inferior, which are upper extremity muscles, and then is iliocostalis, which all blend together at that angle. Um, and so here's, this is just the best article. You know, if you can just go back to this article over and over, I still do, I still need to learn more from this article. It's like 30 pages long from uh, Frank Willard and Vleeming is in this article and Robert Schleip, who's the runs the University of Ulm uh, Fascia Research Center. Um, it's just great. Um, and if, if every low back physician would know this article in detail, there'd be a whole lot less surgery and there'd be a whole lot more insight. It's just a great article. So get it and read it over and over. Uh, and this uh, article is from, uh, this picture is from that article. And this is our traditional MRI slice. And of course, if we're looking with ultrasound, it's totally flipped around. Uh, right, we can't get the ultrasound, and this is all. This is from that article. All these different structures and abbreviations that you start memorizing, and hopefully you don't memorize them as much as you repeat it enough that you understand it. Then you don't have to memorize, right? So if you lay someone prone, then all the words are backwards, which is a problem. Um, all the abbreviations, but at least this is what the ultrasound view is like, right? And this little outline right here is just a nice one to practice over and over with an ultrasound probe. Sweep up and down the lumbar spine until you can identify this little extension and this little extension, right? Posterior spinous process, transverse process. And the way I like to think of these is if, if your vertebra is being controlled in a rotational space, right? We're doing this and and you're not going to get too much tearing and shear through the, that annulus. What do you have to control? What's the best way to control that? It's to control at the tips of these spinous processes, right? It's like a little joystick. They're both like little joysticks and they're sensing where you, they're like little antennas sticking out in space and they're sensing how you're moving and fine tuning that movement so you don't get too much shear uh, through this disc, right? So we're, we're kind of traditionally in medicine and back pain have been focused at all the the end game of the disc breaking down. And it's like, if we focus on these little fine tuning mechanisms, then we're gonna catch things earlier before they get to the point of disc. Short of big trauma, you know, being thrown up in the air and landing on your butt and herniating a disc. Well, that's not a fine tuning problem, right? But most disc things are degeneration slowly over time. And it's because of poor control of these little micro movements as we go through our day, walking and using our arms and everything else. So. That's why I focus on um, how these fascial inputs come. And when you look at this cross-section, 
you're looking at, here's your arm right here, serratus posterior inferior and latissimus dorsi. Your leg is pulling on this fascial layer right here, the posterior layer, because your glute max is feeding into that. And then you've got your paraspinals in here. And that those paraspinals develop within this paraspinal retinacular sheath, which on this article, there's a little checkered line right through there that goes all the way around. So it wraps from posterior spinous process all the way around a transverse process. And that's the fascial tissue that the, all three of these paraspinals develop within as an embryo. And then you're pulling and tensioning that through your abdominal wall coming out this direction. So, and that forms a osteofascial or fibroosseous compartment that sort of creates this pressurized compartment. And so as your paraspinals contract, they don't just lengthen anterior-posterior, they, link, they, they uh, lengthen longitudinally. So you get more longitudinal force from your paraspinal muscles if this is intact. Now, if it's not intact, for instance, if you get some tearing right in here, this whole system is gonna be off a little bit. And of course, every time you do any significant spine surgery, sort of the endoscopic, you cut right through that, right? And then it's gonna form scar, and it's gonna be less efficient in what it's supposed to do in terms of tension uh, maintenance. So it's helpful to also correlate these muscle layers, with or these muscle sections with the bone. So overlying the lamina in general is your multifidus. Overlying your transverse process in general is your longissimus. And then overlying your QL uh, is your iliocostalis. If you just kind of keep those three in mind. And the fact is all of those interact through this aponeurosis, which is this layer right here. This is the aponeurosis of the erector spiny. And multifidi feed into that, longissimus feed into that, and your iliocostalis feed into that. And there's a nice picture of that we'll show in a second. Um, so here's your multifidi. Your multifidi are wider, lower down, narrow, near the TL junction. This is important on ultrasound to understand what you're seeing. So if you put an ultrasound probe here and you slide up like this, then this, these multifidi get smaller and smaller. And your longissimus comes all the way over and is attaching to the posterior spinous process. So here's that aponeurosis, right? And it's broad. And look at the direction of the fibers. They're going from the midline towards the ribs. So as again, as you think of long motions and controlling those motions like uh, throwing a baseball, right? And you're rotating and then you're eccentrically loading all these muscles as you decelerate, uh, right? And so you get a tear here. What happens to your shoulder, right? You get a little loss of control because you affect the latissimus dorsi and the trapezius. And then you can't control your shoulder blade as well. And then you may start getting impingement, right? So again, every time you think there's an extremity problem thing, there could be something going on in the TLF, the thoracolumbar uh, fascia. Okay, so we don't have time to look at that because we've got, what do we have, like 10 minutes, 15 minutes? Who's moderating? 10 minutes, okay. Oh, there's a lot to look at though. Um, well, so this, this, pro, this let me, I'll, I will play that real quick. So this is that patient who can't stand on his leg and is doing this, right? So he's got tears up here, but the aponeurosis down here, which should be a bright white line in this axial view, this, this probe is starting off on this uh, bone, on the iliac uh, bone, basically at the PSIS, and then I'm sliding up that direction. And as I start sliding, there should be a bright white line uh, that's this aponeurosis, and instead it's a jagged line. So as I slide up like that, this little deep line right in here. And again, you need time to go over this to really see it, but um, I, you, I put the probe on there, I'm like, oh my gosh, there's a problem. You go to the other side, it looks completely smooth and well-defined. Um, so, and that's part of this layer. So at L3, it's only here at down at the lower one, it go, bridges all the way across. Um, so if you, and in this view, you've got your upper extremity muscles that have migrated and they're overlying that aponeurosis. So here's latissimus dorsi, 
Mm -hmm. There's serratus posterior inferior, which is actually part of a fascial continuity that goes all the way up to your serratus posterior superior. And those muscles are really just muscle fibers within that continuity of fascia, which again is going to be confusing, but you'll have to just learn more, keep learning this stuff. Uh, if we put our probe here and we see this picture and we don't know this context, we have no idea what we're looking at right here, right? But if you can picture this whole context and you've got this little narrow view, you've got muscle and the first bright white well-defined layer that you can see from that muscle or on top of that muscle is the aponeurosis of the erector spinae, this little, represented by this little fuzzy line here. Um, above that is your posterior layer of your thoracolumbar fascia, which is integrating your upper extremity into the spine. So if we look on the left side of this patient, and this is from the article that I was describing yesterday that just came out February, uh, PM&R Clinics, you've got this thickened irregular appearance on this side of the spinous process, just that little width of the spinous process, right? If you push here with your finger, you feel crepitus. If you slide to the other side of the posterior spinous process, it feels smooth. On the left side, it gives. On the right side, it bounces back. So the more you correlate ultrasound appearance with what you feel under your finger, you start realizing, I know what this is gonna look like on the ultrasound, just by feeling with your fingers and then going, okay, I can predict what's going on under the skin. Um, so this is thickened, heterogeneous, hypoechoic compared to this well-defined attachment here. This aponeurosis is it's harder to find. It's a fuzzier line, right, than this. Um, and so then if we push on this, bonk, get this crepitus snapping under the probe, and then on the right side, it does compress down a little bit, but it holds. And if you zero in on this a little more, remember this is at L1. So the longissimus is coming all the way over and attaching and these multifidae down in here have gotten smaller. And this is part of the tendon or part of the aponeurosis that's attaching here. And as I press on it, you'll see it slide that way. And then we'll slide to the other side and press on that. And there's the same part of the fibrous, you know, tendinous from the longissimus and it's holding in place. So back to the left and it's unstable and sliding around. And here it's holding in place. So in the article, I kind of tried to show this, like this is the maximal compression that I could find on that video. And the longissimus has just shrunk down to nothing. Uh, and this is pulled away here. And you can see below that part of the multifidus layer of fibrous tissue that's feeding in here is all irregular as well. So his multifidi aren't working well, his longissimus is not working well at this layer. And he's got a little cortical pit, like a little miniature cortical pit you might see on an ultrasound of a rotator cuff at the greater tuberosity of the, you know, you see these little pits and you go, oh, there's something going on with the rotator cuff there. Now I'm getting over and like see these on a, on a spinous process and I go, hmm, there's something going on here. I need to just palpate a little more with the probe and see if I can understand this more. Um, so this guy had years of left-sided muscle spasm in his low back. Um, and he's like, it didn't, he didn't have a lot of back pain, but he's just frustrated. He's like, I'm like 40 and I can't exercise. And he, I start doing any exercise and my back starts tightening up and goes into spasm. So I just, I don't run. I don't, you know, and I love to run. So we treated him there with PRP and um, kind of like this. So here's the needle coming in from lateral, hitting this little L1 spinous process. We're really zoom and just fenestrating through and injecting as I go, right? Once I kind of have an idea, then it's, you're not that precise. You're precise, but spreading it out, right? And you're not doing a bolus volume of five cc's in one spot. You're just infiltrating all through. That's my technique anyway. So if you'll, then this is the treatment day at that L1 posterior spinous process and all this snapping and sliding around. Whoop, sorry, I'm supposed to let that play. It'll switch to the other side. These videos are available through the article through the PMR Clinic's website. See, I told you we wouldn't get through it all, right? Okay, so while this is playing, I'm gonna let it play over and over again. But um, 
the, I'm do, I, what I've started doing is some workshops in my office for three days to learn this stuff in detail with the main goal of being getting enough people trained who are really motivated to understand this so that we can have a large workshop, like a one day pre-conference or a separate workshop for, through AUM, and I can have table trainers. <laughs> um, and then I can have someone who learns this who can treat my fascial stuff, which is what I still have left <laughs> uh, from my old mountain bike injury 25, now to almost 26 years ago. Um, um, cause it's, it's the detail. So here's another, this, I showed this a few years ago. This is a 17 year old volleyball player who had rotator cuff impingement and chronic bursitis. And she couldn't get her arm all the way up and she's 17 and she's been through two years of physical therapy. And, uh, I can't, I th can't remember if she had a steroid injection at that point. Uh, but they're treating it as a impingement here. And the way we ended up fixing it was actually, this is around the, TL junction like T12, here's compressing on her left side. Here's compressing on her right side. Not a huge difference, but there's definitely a difference, right? You can see this is compressing down more. Look at that facet region, this facet region, and see how much closer this gets to the skin than this does as I'm pressing. And I love it when patients then correlate findings for you. Because I'm looking at this going, Okay, am I overreading this? Is this is this really significant? Is this you know maybe it doesn't mean anything? And she says, "Is that you clicking or is that me?" Right? And she has no back pain. It's all right here is her pain. But if I compress this area a little bit and retest her impingement tests, they're completely negative. If I don't hold there, and she oh you know she can't hold her shoulder up. Um, so it's shoulder impingement because of a tear at the thoracolumbar fascia at the TL junction. But it makes sense, right? It's not magic. You know, for years you'd see, I, you know, people come in and say, oh, this applied kinesiology person just kind of scans over me and then says, this is where your problem is. And then he's able to help me. I'm like, well, that seems kind of weird and esoteric. And who was it that yesterday, sorry, I don't remember your name, your dad, figured this same kind of stuff out. There you are, yeah. Uh, he's an MD who, f she came up, she was like, my dad's been doing this for years. He figured out the same kind of stuff. And then Aeneas Janzi came up to me yesterday and said, you know, you're doing stuff that's just like uh, Weinstock, neurokinetic therapy. And I've only heard it like one or two lectures from him. I've never trained with Weinstock. But we're all finding the same thing, right? So we're, these, these are very true things. They're just subtle and the, the fact is, is that once the whole medical community understands this better, there's gonna be a lot less unnecessary surgery. And we want necessary surgery, not unnecessary surgery, right? We don't wanna bash surgeons, we want to say, we want every surgery that you do to be a success, right? And we really need to be, I try to watch my language a little more than I used to and not get so, it's like there's no use bashing people. We're all, all doctors are trying to do their best. I really believe that. We all went into this profession because we want to help people. Surgeons are the same as us, right? Um, and there are surgeons in the audience. So we, we really need to get collaborative, collaborative, collaborative with every other special and start focusing on this big picture together and taking the small bits that these various specialties know and valuing them, right? and bouncing back and forth between those perspectives. So I think we're gonna stop there. There's a lot more to go over, so I hope some of y'all will see me in Austin and we can move this forward. Uh-huh.